Next on Primary Care, the history of black health in Detroit. Important enough not to be forgotten. Now contrary to what the movies show you about blacks escaping the South through the Underground Railroad, these people came here sick. Hello, and welcome to Primary Care, where each week we focus on topics relevant to the health and care of African Americans. I'm Dr. Lonnie Joe. For years, researchers have found inequities between African Americans and white Americans regarding access to health care and health outcomes. In the city of Detroit, where over 80% of residents are African American, the rates of infant mortality, heart disease, and hypertension are amongst the highest in the country. In addition, Detroit residents are less likely to have adequate health insurance and access to quality health care. So, how did the city get to where the health of so many African Americans is so poor? And what should those of us who have the vested interest in the city do to move the needle towards more positive health outcomes? Well, we knew of no better person than to answer some of those questions than our own honorary historian on black health, Dr. Richard Smith. Dr. Smith is Vice President of Physician Outreach at Henry Ford Hospital and the first African American to serve as President of the Michigan State Medical Society. He is past president of the Wayne County Medical Society of Southeastern Michigan and a practicing obstetrician and gynecologist who's delivered more than 8,000 babies in Detroit. Richard, welcome to the show. Welcome. It is an honor to have you here. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's 9,001. <laughs> and counting. <laughs> 9,000. And Detroit is my home. My grandfather's grandfather was born here. So I know a little bit about his history and everything else. How about, so you're not a transplant. You're a native we're, Detroiter. Well, all transplants at some point <laughs> at some in time. Point, some of right. us by choice, others because we just had to get here. But uh, I do appreciate here. I appreciate the people in, in the city of Detroit in Southeast Michigan have, have allowed me to practice medicine these last 46 years. 46. You, you've had faith and trust in me and uh, I really appreciate that and wholeheartedly thank you for, for your trusting in me. I want to thank the, the men and women who worked as simple jobs as sometimes the unit clerks at hospitals, the nurses who have worked at the hospitals to make all of this happen because they worked hard and very a lot of times they just simply aren't think. I want to thank them. I want to thank the great teachers I've had, people like Dr. Charles Vincent, Dr. Combs, Dr. Dr. Yeah. Chavis, uh, just those wonderful people in Dr. Wardell. Uh, these, these are some fantastic physicians that we've seen, and my colleagues, uh, Dr. Shade and uh, Valerie Montgomery Rice, and the list goes on and on and on. It's just been a fabulous practice, the, the ability to practice medicine. But each one of those people, they have a story of their struggles to get where they are, and yet they achieve beyond all imagination, each and every one of those. And I think that's what we're here to talk about now. Absolutely. So let's go back. Let's, oh. let, you know, as the song said, let's go way back then, okay? Well, talk to us about, well, we can't go too far back. We'll be here forever. But talk to us about medical education well, and African Americans. Well, I'm going to tell you before that, I'm going to tell you about the wonderful people we have in the city of Detroit okay. as, as opposed to health care. I'm going to take us all the way back to when people, why do people come here, particularly African Americans. They it came used to here be for, the Mecca. They, they came yes. here, and before the Civil War, they came here for freedom. Uh, for freedom from slavery, freedom from the, 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 the treatment they were, but also the freedom to educate their kids. And uh, they came through a system, a lot of them were free, some, but a lot came through the Underground Railroad. Mm -hmm. The Underground Railroad here in Michigan, uh, out of Detroit, 40 to 50,000 people will cross the Detroit River to, to freedom in Canada, in places like Amherstburg and Windsor and Chatham and things like that. Now, contrary to what the movies show you about blacks escaping the South through the Underground Railroad, these people came here sick. They came here sick, they had dysentery, they had pneumonitis, they had broken limbs, they had open scars from the running and the things that they had to do and hide. They were not a healthy group of people, these 40 and 50. But there was one man there, a Dr. Joseph Ferguson, who helped them, an agent with the Underground Railroad, personal friend of Frederick Douglass, who's a monument to his downtown Detroit, if you're ever down there, to Joseph Ferguson. And what he did, he helped and he treated those people from the very beginning. He had good medical training in Pennsylvania before coming here, but it was not quite the legitimate doctors as hospital and medical schools didn't quite exist. But the people in the community of Detroit, they brought the bandages, they brought the solves, they did everything they can to help these people. That's where healthcare for African Americans began in the city of Detroit. 
Around that time also, uh, a, f a fellow named Zena Pitcher. People may know him as being the mayor of Detroit, mm -hmm. but he was also a physician. Right. He was a doctor, he started the University of Michigan, he was the president of the, America, the new American Medical Association. You know, in that time before the Civil War, they met here in Detroit, the AMA, and they talked about the pro some of the problems that we talked about just now, but also one of the high on their agenda, so believe it or not, was lead in the drinking water. That's from the minutes of the AMA in the 1950s. More than 130 <laughs> years ago now. 130 years ago. But fast forwarding with that, Civil War came. After the Civil War, they had all these Army field hospitals, and one of those hospitals was uh, our young Harper Hospital. And like all those soldiers who came back from the Civil War, they had been pretty busy, but they didn't marry these young women that they were busy with. So there were a lot of children who were born in this region, and, um, and they established the, what was called the Women's Hospital. Now these and a few other hospitals were the creation of the first organized medical care in the city of Detroit. They said, well, we probably need some doctors. So there were a couple of medical schools in Detroit, and they all had their little doctors and stuff like that, but, but the one which would eventually become the Wayne State Medical School would, would have his first graduate, Dr. Joseph Ferguson. That was our first African-American physician. That's how it started. So we had the school up in Ann Arbor and, and the school in Detroit, which produced physicians. Unfortunately, the Detroit Medical College only produced, between the Civil War and the turn of the century, two doctors, whereas Michigan did a little bit better than that. And because they were more progressive, more focused on doing universal education. And that takes us up to the 20th century, Turn, 19th the century. Yeah. Right. Now, that's when things really began to get interesting. It got heated up. It got heated up quite a bit. During that time there, Michigan, the state of Michigan had, had uh, oh, probably about eight medical schools here. The country had 400 medical schools that existed in this country. They're not the kind of medical schools that we see now. They were the type of medical school is that you got a check? Well, they didn't have check. If you got some money, you can come to our medical school. People actually took share, shares and took profits from medical schools. We call those proprietary schools. And in the South, the only thing you had to do to go to school was have a, uh, well, had gone to high school. You didn't have to graduate, but you had the right connection, somebody's son or daughter, and the right resources, and you became a doctor. And they had all kinds of different medical schools. We call those proprietary schools. No science at all to that sort of thing. Then about 1910, the AMA got together with a fellow named Abraham Flexner, who took a serious look at this and changed the way medicine is and it brings us to where we are here. In what's called the Flexner Report. Dr. Smith, hold it right there because that's a turning point in the history of medical education, but we're up against a break. We're gonna come right back Certainly. and take it from there. Coming up next, you'll hear from a prominent African-American physician whose father was denied staff privileges to the very hospital he later became the president of. Hi, I'm Loretta Bush, president and CEO for Authority Health. Testing still remains an important tool in our fight against coronavirus. While many people may have symptoms, such as cough, fever, or shortness of breath, some will have only mild symptoms or no symptoms, but still be able to transmit. There are many opportunities to test in our community, including at our Popoff Family Health Center. Call 313-824-1000. Healthcare leader and child advocate Dr. Herman Gray was the first African American to become president and CEO of Children's Hospital in Michigan. It was the very same hospital that his father, who was a surgeon, was denied privileges. Dr. Gray shares his story. Well, my dad, um, you know, was uh, you know a successful physician, but he had to really work hard at that success. Um, uh, because in Detroit at that time, even though it was you know, up north, uh, uh, African American physicians, for the most part, could not practice in the majority hospitals. And uh, they could not get staff privileges in those hospitals. Uh, and uh, so I saw my dad rarely during the week um, because he would get in his car, usually on a Sunday, and drive to Roanoke, Virginia, to North Carolina, uh, to one place or another, um, typically small towns, interestingly, uh, usually southern small towns, um, uh, where uh, they needed doctors so desperately that they would accept a black physician. He did have some time that he practiced in the city itself, in the city of Detroit itself, um, because I remember 
as a little guy carrying his doctor bag, you know, back then doctors made house calls, they you know, sort of did it all, um, and making rounds with him in two hospitals I remember distinctly, um, Burden Mercy Hospital, uh, which was a, a black, a so-called black hospital uh, started by Dr. Burden. Um, and the other hospital was uh, called Rest Haven Hospital um, on West Grand Boulevard near the intersection of Tyreman and Grand River, um, you know, right there near Northwestern High School, uh, where my mother went to high school. And uh, that was a converted big house, basically. Um, and those were the kind of places that you know, black patients, if they wanted their black doctors to take care of them, uh, that's typically where they would have to go. This is not ancient history, the fact that black physicians could not practice in majority hospitals. I mean, I, I personally knew um, or know uh, the doctors who were the first pediatricians, as an example, who got on the medical staff at Children's Hospital. Dr. James Collins um, you know, is still alive. He's been recognized by Wayne State for his work in teaching medical students and uh, working on the admissions committee. Um, you know, he was, I think, maybe the second or third black doctor given staff privileges at Children's. Um, Natalia Tanner, who died you know, just a few years ago, um, you know, and who was, both of those people were very good to me personally, um, you know, was uh, the first African-American woman pediatrician admitted to the medical staff at Children's Hospital. Um, you know, and these are people that were, you know, alive into the 2000s, and then Dr. Collins is still alive. You know, he's well into his 80s, but he's, he's alive and well. Uh, and so this is, um, you know, you know I, I suppose really um, remarkable, you know, American you know, stories um, that from one generation to the next, you go from not being able to even walk in the doors, um, you know, they, they, they had so little respect for you, um, you know, to, um, you know, myself being president of one of those hospitals um, uh, in one generation is, is important, uh, I think, in particularly in the current environment um, where uh, in many ways things seem so dark and that we're you know, taking lots of steps backwards uh, that um, uh, we should, uh, you know, certainly as African Americans, you know, uh, and uh, we should take hope in uh, and uh, strengthen our faith in the fact that while, you know, the road towards full equity um, and equality is a long road um, and a clearly a bumpy road. Um, you know, as Martin Luther King uh, said, the arc of justice uh, bends, um, uh, you know, the arc of history, you know, bends towards justice. Uh, and I think that, um, you know, the Herman Gray Jr. and the Herman Gray Sr. story is, you know, one small example of that. Rick, Dr. Herman Gray, friends of both of ours for many years, um, Tell us how his story, his personal story, he and his father, fit into the historical pattern that we've seen here in Detroit. Well, their story is certainly very typical of the sort of struggles that African-American physicians have had. I'm going to share with you a few stories as we talk about the history, almost identical with that. Uh, you, you speak of the wonderful Dr. Tanner, who pretty much invented the, the specialty of adolescent medicine. She was the only board-certified pediatrician in Detroit and yet she was denied privileges at a hospital where the doctors weren't even as qualified as she, she was. was. Yes, correct. But she changed the world and she also was the president of the Michigan Association of Pediatricians, an avid member of the, of the National Medical Association and the Detroit Medical Society, as well as a graduate of Meharry Medical College in Nashville. Did she go to Ann Arbor during that turbulent time of privileges, no privileges, and, 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 and seek privileges there like some of the other people we know? I don't know that part of her history at all, but I can say that Michigan, uh, in terms of medicine, has, has stood out since the, in the modern age of medicine. It's one of the premier places in this country we have in the state of Michigan. We're fortunate to have that, and the graduates who have come from the University of Michigan. Earlier, we talked about the Flexner Report, now, and the Flexner Report was commissioned by the AMA to work with the Carnegie Foundation to look at the medical schools. At that time, there were roughly about 200 medical schools in the country, and he visited about most of them. And then his coming, coming back, he said, we need to shut down over 100 of these medical schools. They're not true medical schools. And in that, he 100 of the ma majority of white schools, but also of the eight medical, black medical schools, he recommended sh shutting down six of them, leaving us with Howard and Meharry. 
he would on, go on to say that we, there needs to be a scientific basis to the study of medicine and people need to have at least one a high school graduation and number two, two years of college with study in sciences, which was, everybody said, well, that's going to cut into our profits. Uh, a lot of those schools, it was just a profit and proprietary machine. As a result of it, he recommends shutting down over 100, down to 31 medical schools in the country, but it kind of ended up at about 50 or 60. He said the top four medical schools in North America were Johns Hopkins, the University of Michigan, Wake Forest, and Western University in Cleveland. And they required you to have learning in that. And surprisingly, those same schools, um, um, uh, particularly the University of Michigan, had the highest number of African Americans in the school. Even that during that time? During that time, the first graduate, one of the, one of the first chiefs of staff at Howard University in the 19th century was a graduate of the University of Michigan, John uh, Richards Francis. Uh, historically, they've named schools after him and everything else. He was the most, the best doctor in, in, in Washington, D.C. Another surprising of those hospitals he, he, he proposed closing included Georgetown Hospital, George Washington Medical School, but not Howard University or Meharry. In fact, Friedman's Hospital, he cited, was one of the most unique and best hospitals in the country. At Howard. At, at, at Howard. And that came out of that particular report. Uh, the other thing we see in that is that he recommended that, um, that the, uh, we need to support Howard and Meharry so that we can produce, continue to produce good doctors. The downside of his report is that he came through the, a Jim Crow era and he kind of thought that black doctors just need to take care of black patients and kind of need to work with white doctors, which was a struggle which existed and created problems for the rest of the country. Because as I mentioned, all those other schools, uh, half the schools in the country did not accept black students. And that existed up until the, to, World War, uh, to the end of World War II. So we're looking at decades. Oh, without a doubt. But without a doubt, but Michigan traditionally would have two, three, sometimes as many as four African Americans, Americans in their class. And, and you, there was a pipeline from Michigan to Howard University. One such professor, Simeon Carson, who was a grandson of slaves who grew up in Ann Arbor, his, his father planted trees along what's called the Diag in Ann Arbor. He was the number one student in Ann Arbor, went to University of Michigan Medical School, did service for the government, became a fine, renowned surgeon, came back to Detroit, but he found that, this was in 1903, that they, he could not get a job at the hospitals here. And he scored number one, the top score on the examination by the board. So he went to Howard, where he became chief of staff, worked alongside a famous doctor there, the heart doctor, Dr. Dan, Dan, who was there, and also trained a young student whose name is Charles Drew. I mean, that's the linkage that we have in this community here. The years that followed, the students such as Alexander Turner and Augustus Purvis would leave the, uh, Michigan and they would go to Howard University to get their additional training because Flexner says you need a, a year of internship under your belt to do that. Now, Augustus Purvis is the grandson of uh, Robert Purvis who led the Underground Railroad in Philadelphia. This is a quality of men that they had coming through there. Alexander Turner came with some of his roommates. They used to live on 1017 Catherine Street in Ann Arbor, which is down by the train station, if you know Ann Arbor. Right. They came to Detroit, and they started practicing medicine once they left Howard. They came here, and they said, the people need health care. And they weren't getting it. The white hospitals didn't accept black doctors or black, black patients. patients. And so they came up with this idea of the Dunbar Hospital. Him, Dr. James, another graduate of Howard, and 20 other doctors, well actually 10 at that time, got together and established Dunbar Hospital to treat black patients. Which the structure still stands it's today? It still stands today. Got started by the ideas of, of two physicians, uh, Dr. Ames and also Dr. Alexander Turner, a graduate in the University of Michigan. Dr. Turner became the most well-known surgeon in Detroit. With these men who came from Ann Arbor, they worked together and uh, they built this hospital to care for African-American people. It had great philanthropy from St. Matthew's Church where they were all members of during that period, period of time. Now, the thing about Alexander Turner, he was brilliant. He was brilliant. He had five pharmacies. He had an office that catered to both black and white, particularly the, the immigrant Polish community right on Tyreman near uh, the West Grand Boulevard and everything else. His family lived upstairs. The pharmacy was down below. He was so good. He was the only black granted privileges to the white hospitals. And they invited him because he had the best hands, surgical hands in the city. He had a chauffeur. 
he did okay. He, he had did, a show for he had He did very well. And this group of men that he grew, came through Ann Arbor with, they were personal friends of W.V.C. Du Bois and everything else, also lawyers, Charge Mahoney, that uh, those folks started things, institutions we still see. They were supportive of the, the, the new NAACP, the new Urban League, the new Y, that they had institutions that were necessary for the number of people that came during the first great migration where the city's population of African Americans went from 5,000 up to 25,000 suddenly. And so with that group of friends, they formed a nucleus also for the Detroit Medical Society. And all these things emerged from this small group of friends who were progressive ideal thinkers and did sort of like these fellows who were fantastic. And I just say fellows from the standpoint because they all were. There was one uh, a Michigan grad who would go on to start a nursing school during that period of time too. Now was this the nursing school associated with Dunbar Hospital no, at one time? No, this is another one that was formed actually in Toronto okay. um, and there. So, but getting back to the Detroit area, though, so these, 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 these gentlemen were wonderful, but they, have, they were restricted. They were restricted areas where people could live. The hospitals did not accept black patients at all, and, um, and, but the, the doctors did what they can. They were mission-driven people here. And now the story about Alexander Turner took a turn. We go from the 19, 19 up to the mid-1925 or so. He did pretty good. Like anything else, well, it's time for us to move out of this apartment above my office and buy a house. And he bought a house on Spokane, which is on the other side of Tyreman, which was a restricted area. When he moved his, into his home, his family, his home, a crowd of 2,000 people surrounded his house. And they tore the bricks off his house, they tore the shingles off the roof, they broke the windows, and they, they, the police came, because he was friends with the mayor, because he, you know, he was the big doctor in town. They sent the police squadron to escort him out of his own house. The windows were what they broke into the car, they broke the windows, they scarred his face to the point that he couldn't even practice anymore. And this is a man who did so much for this area. We're all very familiar with the Ossian Sweet case in Detroit, but this happened the same year. The same? The same, the very same 20, year, 1925. 25. So what happened with that, they ushered him out. He had to lay on the bottom of his car in order to be ushered out of, uh, out of the, the mob up the other side of Tyreman. They went to the same church with uh, Austin Sweet's wife, St. Matthews, and he heard about this stuff. And he said, that's not gonna happen to me. If they come, to, I'm gonna buy a house too over on the east side. And he did buy a house. He moved his family in there, they were celebrating. Same mob, organized by the same individuals, they knew the name, they surrounded the house, and they threw bricks into his house. Someone from inside the house fired a shot and killed someone. They arrested eight people in that house for the murder of this person, and it became the trial of the century, the Ossian Sweet trial. Is this the uh, famous attorney the trial? The famous, famous attorney, uh, Clarence Darrell, defined, defined. But also, you don't hear about the black attorneys on the, tr on the case. Exactly. One of the black attorneys on the case was Charles Mahoney, who was good friends and lived in the house in Ann Arbor with Alexander Turner. So that's the story, that's how history comes together. They won the case. The tragedy of that case, though, was the fact that his wife was also arrested for murder. She was put into the Detroit jail where she sat there for weeks until the trial was over. During that time, she contracted TB and had died before the age of 30. Wow. That's the side of the story that. that people don't hear about. But yet and still, people continued. They said, we need health for the people. We saw schools, Howard and Meharry were beginning to produce the top doctors in, in the country. The automotive business was expanding, and black physicians and lawyers and dentists began to move to Detroit in the 20s and the 30s. So you had an influx of physicians from Meharry, and they couldn't, op they couldn't work in the hospitals here, so they started about 14 different hospitals. Detroit became known as the black hospital mecca of the, of the country because providing care to the millions of people now who have moved to this area. Emerging out of the Michigan group was a phys physician called Remus Robinson. Oh. Remus Robinson finished at the, near the top of his class at the University of Michigan. Fully trained, board certified surgeon came there. He came to Detroit to get board privileges, I mean to get privileges in the hospitals. He was denied. He was denied, but not to be outdone, he continued in the political process, became a leader of the NAACP. He's school board president. And became elected as the first black school board president yes. in the country of the third largest school district in the country. 
Eventually, he became uh, on the board at Wayne State University, but not before all the struggles that this brilliant young man had. He was on staff at Michigan, but yet he was not accepted here. Here in no hospitals in Detroit, but granted privileges at the University The of problem that existed in many of the hospitals, they had never trained an African-American physician before. They didn't have medical students between the, the turn of the century in 1945, the end of the World War II, Wayne only graduated seven black doctors, seven, during that time period. At the same time you go at the University of Michigan, it's over a hundred doctors which were trained and sent out into the world. And followed by Michigan was Harvard. And so it was difficult to get this education in medical school, but they came to Detroit to care for the people. Dr. Smith, this, this is just a time out for us. We're gonna continue this. Uh, uh, we could do this uh, <laughs> for many hours because you're such a wealth of knowledge and thank you for uh, reminding us of, of this kind of history. If it's not told properly, it may not be told at all. So thank you again. We're going to do part two on this. Thank you for joining us on Primary Care. Thank you very Care. much. Excellent. Very much. Our guest has been Dr. Richard Smith, Vice President of Physician Outreach at Henry Ford Hospital and a past president of both the Michigan State Medical Society and Wayne County Medical Society. If you learned anything from today's show, it's that the history has not been told properly. As I said, we have to tell that history and make it known, pass it along. If not, it will be lost. It will almost be if, it's, if it never occurred. For Primary Care, I'm Dr. Lonnie Joe.